It's a very warm welcome to Africa 360. We bring you news and views on Africa from every angle. I'm Chris Marileng and this is Africa 360. This week's show is all about building Africa from the people to the ports. The continent is experiencing unprecedented growth, but an estimated 40% of productivity is lost due to lack of infrastructure. And we need almost 100 billion US dollars a year to close that gap. It's time to find solutions. And that's exactly what the Build Africa Forum was about. Held for the first time in Brazzaville, in the Republic of Congo, thousands gathered to find answers to Africa's infrastructure problems. Guest anchor Lindy Mdongana and the Africa 360 team were there. Take a look. This week, Africa 360 comes to you from the first to ever Build Africa Forum here in Brazzaville, the Republic of Congo. I'm your special guest anchor, Lindy Mtongana. Stay with us as we find out just what it takes to build Africa. The Bold Africa Conference in Brazzaville is the first of its kind and it certainly set the bar high, setting out to make infrastructure interesting and of course to attract investors. This conference has achieved, at least in my opinion, in identifying and also underscoring some of the major challenges. So many uh, investors are coming around the world gathering to invest in Africa. Africa is a very, very attractive uh, a continent right now. It's really the time to get right the infrastructure and to put all the tools and the strategy to have it right. This is a very important event um, to have contacts here and to see how things develop, what are the new trends. There was a lot of talk at the conference about the need to integrate Africa properly if Africa is going to start benefiting and prospering. The Republic of Congo rolled out the red carpet, revamping the Maya Maya airport just in time to welcome high-powered delegates. But the saying, build it and they will come, does not guarantee a return on investment. Africa needs an estimated $100 billion to bridge the continent's infrastructure divide. On the positive side, for the past five years, policymakers have worked on creative ways to build the continent. Actually, we are not very outspoken about our success stories. We've been doing actually innovative financing, but those success stories, they were not only success stories by using our old techniques or old uh, methodology. Uh, for example, let me give you a very concrete one from Senegal. When we start working on Senegal airport project, we quickly realized that we could be more efficient in the, con in the country and also we can do the project in a way, project could be more successful by multiplying that project with others. Means that integrating number of infrastructure projects and then financing all of them at the same time. This efficiency is not only profitable, it also brings local development. And according to some, Africa is still too dependent on international intervention. This is not rocket science. What does it take to produce tomato paste? What does it take to produce leather? What does it take to produce textiles and fabric? Well, perhaps the answer is infrastructure to get goods to the market. No, yes? it's this. <laughs> okay. Outspoken former Nigerian Central Bank Governor Lamidou Sanusi used his platform to challenge the status quo. He certainly did not hold back. Look, I think most of these decisions are 70% political, 30% economic. Um, if, you, we, if we're honest with ourselves, there are too many African leaders and African elites who are benefiting from the way things are. And um, change basically forces them uh, to change the way they've made money, to change the way they, they, they've lived their lives. So we've got to address the political issues. We've got to address the vested interests that do not want change. Um, it's very easy to hold control of the state, use the state to extract rent, and basically build up resources. 
it's much more difficult to think of the state as an agent of development. The bold statement did little for his own career, though. He was sacked just weeks later. Many have criticized the move, saying it's tantamount to government involvement in monetary policy, and that highlights an entirely new question. Perhaps the largest obstacle to Africa's infrastructure development is political. Lindsay Schutel, Brazzaville. If Africa is to change, you know, we are the ones that have to change it. The Build Africa Forum has turned into more than a discussion on just physical infrastructure. Bridges, highways and ports alone cannot build a country. In fact, today, infrastructure is expected to be as human as it is sturdy. Africa is a continent of opportunity. And no one knows that better than those gathered at the Build Africa Forum. Over 500 leading policymakers, developers, finances, and infrastructure operators have gathered to explore the continent's vast potential for growth. African youth are also making their voices heard at the forum. Education, training, be local, stick to your commitments, and water. Those were the things that our all-star panel of job creators yesterday said to us were the most important things to facilitate job creation in African infrastructure. And as I sat back there, my back against the wall, standing room only, I thought, we're missing capacity. Capacity is so incredibly important to leverage the giant talent, of pool, of the giant pool of youth that, Afri that Africa has to be able to find a way out of the infrastructure deficit. Among them, Africa 2.0, a civil society organization promoting positive change. Africa 2.0 is a network of young, very um, energetic and very, very influential people within a network of countries. About 26 countries are represented in this network. And essentially, we are young people that are progressive and young people that are passionate about making a difference on our continent. You'd find that our members or my fellow chapter um, individuals are leaders within key sectors, within the economy, within government, in their own countries. So if Africa is to change, you know, we are the ones that have to change it. Africa is lagging when it comes to the access and uptake of information and communication technologies. But the potential for growth has been identified in certain circles. The continent's ICT sector has experienced steady growth driven by large-scale infrastructure projects. The adoption of ICT solutions in sectors like banking and telecoms has also played a huge role. Young entrepreneurs and innovators across the continent are charting new ground in the sector too. They're ensuring that Africa harnesses ICT's social and economic potential. One such example is the Ghana Cyber City. Pioneered by Yao Owusu, an IT leader in Africa, the $130 million business and technology park has the potential to transform Africa's IT economy. What this seeks to do uh, is a number of things. Number one is to promote the creation of startup companies. That is already happening, but this is to <clears throat> excuse me, facilitate you know, the, the springing up or the pro proliferation of um, startup companies you know, in Ghana, starting with Ghana, and in, um, in Africa in general. Number one is to create um, what we call intelligent building or intelligent workspace for technology companies. So um, IBM is in Ghana, Google. You know, there are quite a number of big, you know, br big brand tech companies that are in Ghana and Africa. And there are more that are sort of on their way coming in. We really don't have the infrastructure to support those, you know, those firms. 
many of many of those companies um, rent or buy, you know, dilapidated, sometimes residential facilities, and they convert them into offices. So what we seek to do to to basically build the the spaces for for those companies to rent, you know, and run their business. That's number one. Uh, number two, and what? Okay, number two is the incubation of startup companies. So we would actually have a service that would um, that would make it easier to create and manage a startup company. Um, we would also build uh, what is known as a data center. A data center is um, is a, it's like a supercomputer where companies store their servers. When I say companies, it's not necessarily IT companies, but um, especially companies from all industries, especially those that deal with um, a lot of data. From data to ideas, Africans have certainly found creative ways to rebuild the continent. And while there are still many obstacles, there is no shortage of talent. For us, uh, those, those are the two biggest you know, challenges. Um, yeah, access to capital and then uh, talent management. Can I, can I add on that? Yeah. Well, my, my opinion is that regional integration as well. You know, as a South African, it's quite embarrassing to come to these forums because I'm probably one of the few South Africans that are here. Yeah. And it's like the continent is huge, one billion people. We are not integrated. We are a small little island at the tip of this continent. Yeah. There's no regional integration. If I don't do an initiative in South Africa that's going to bring you know, Yao to South Africa and tell people what he's doing, people from Kenya, and um, there's amazing things that are happening with the IHAB, um, the, the, what's it called, the safari, the Savannah, uh, Silicon yeah. Savannah, yeah. citing things. You know, about how do you integrate a nation of, you know, didn't have the resources, but there was political will to actually ensure that people can go digital people are illiterate you know e as in like e illiterate <laughs> so i think there's a lot that needs to be done in terms yeah. of regional integration and that's probably one of the few steps uh, towards change tapping into that talent will need a shift from traditional bureaucracy to creative collaboration you know coming in and doing great value chain powerpoint presentations to government ministers and so on is one thing. There's a consulting model that involves coming in and providing advice and going away and crossing your fingers, hoping the government executes in the way you've advised. But if they don't execute, you get called in again. Right? Yeah. This is different. We're an execution platform. We're going to, we're going to embed people in government yeah, who will actually execute. So where should governments place that focus? Uh, African governments are not doing enough to um, facilitate um, development of, um, you know, ICT. Um, well, I mean, to their credit, though, um, the government helped in um, facilitating the, the, the te telecom boom. But, but telecom is only one aspect of, you know, ICT, as you know. Um, I mean, let's take something like uh, Technology Park, the development of a tech park. Uh, the government of Ghana has had um, on the drawing board developing a, a tech park for, for quite some time. But um, you know, it has taken you know quite you know uh, it still hasn't really been implemented yet. It's a complex issue. Unfortunately, for many countries in Africa, um, it is the older generation that get access to power. Many of them, you know, not to not to put anybody down, but many of the old guys have not even sent an email, you know, in the, in their lives. So it's not not necessarily a good thing or bad thing, but it's a fact. And so many of them simply. Um, do not have, um, they just don't have, um, they're not passionate about, because, partly because of their background. So that is one problem. Many of them just don't have the passion or the, um, you know, the motivation. You know, they just don't see the vision in, in technology. That's number one. Number two is um, that uh, part of it is also, um, you know, political, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, when, when, when a, uh, a country is, um, when a country is too political, what happens is that, um, okay, let's say uh, some kind of development of a technology park or, or any, any venture, when, when it's influenced by government. Remember one guy from the airline industry was talking about how government should get out of the way of um, yeah. running airlines yeah. <laughs> because a lot of national airlines are running at losses, like uh, Air Morocco, Air Morocco you know, and some other airlines. Um, anyway, so it's similar in uh, information technology as well, because you don't even get the right talent, because the people that would run government um, 
government-run or government-managed ventures, many of them would be people who, who are relatives of ministers and things like that, not necessarily the right talent. So th those are some of the problems. As a person <coughs> who is an action person, who is part of Africa 2.0, in June we're going to be having a um, Gasi to Gasi um, Go Digital Summit uh, with the Innovation Hub in South Africa. And it's about townships, all about township entrepreneurs, teaching them about Google, Google Drive, teaching them about you, um, uh, YouTube, teaching them about Skype, go to meetings. All these things are fundamental to ensuring that you can actually do business. It's very important. In Africa, we're terrible marketeers. In fact, we are the worst marketeers on the planet. Because how could you can have uh, have under your feet 60% of all the undiscovered resources on the planet and still look at yourselves as being poor. His name is synonymous with style. Oswald Boateng is a Ghanaian British tailor whose keen eye, attention to detail and perfectly cut suits catapulted him to global recognition. After conquering the fashion world, Boateng started the Made in Africa Foundation. The aim is to provide funding for feasibility studies for new projects and help local developers find financial assistance. So what is a tailor doing at an infrastructure conference? I suppose being a tailor, you know, one thing you learn is how things are made and you're about building, so it's construction. So uh, maybe that's, that's kind of, a, there's a relationship there. There's obviously a, a strong element in design in what I do. But um, I'm very passionate about uh, infrastructure development in Africa. And mainly because, for my own selfish reasons, is uh, originate from Ghana and I'm a bit bored of kind of getting off the plane at Ghana with my kids and open drains and you know buildings unfinished and roads that are not working and so I just felt look you know it's, it's it, there's, there's no longer an excuse for that lack of development and it seems to be the, the running story across the continent at least sub-Saharan Africa I'm very um, you know coming from a a background as a designer, for me things are very simple. The fabric could be made into this, the fabric costs this, cost me this to make it, I sell it for this. You know, that's my universe. You know, so when I looked at the, um, the, the, the issue we had with these feasibility master plans, it's the same thing, you know. You package it, basically say this is what we're going to build, it'll cost this, and we want to sell it for this. So, um, so we've realized that that has been probably the most single most important thing in terms of African development, development in terms of infrastructure is someone financing those plans. Where others see problems, Boateng sees potential. The designer believes the continent's infrastructure backlog should be viewed as a blank canvas, an opportunity to design uniquely African cities. The ambition is to make the continent an example for the planet. Because you've got to understand here is this, you're dealing with a blank sheet of paper. So all those issues that you have in development, when you have a legacy infrastructure, like in the UK, you've got infrastructure is centuries and centuries old. So when you try to build new concepts of how things should be built, you're building something already is you're building an old infrastructure, it means cost is significantly higher and it's complicated. In Africa, we don't have these issues. You can actually go and build buildings with solar technology built into the, the concept of the building. You can, you know, there's studies about, you know, when you're in the cities and you don't allow cars to get into the center, the crime rate drops. So there's a lot of information out there that's available that we can use in developing these cities for the future. So I, my, my vision of the future is that Africa will have cities the world's never seen before. But there's so many examples now of what you should not do. So 
you're not just going to copy. And because we're still at a very basic level of thinking about our issues, so, oh my god, no power, so I run, try to sort the power, then oh my god, the road, and we're running around, we're not thinking. But the moment there's examples of sitting back, proper master plans, and actually really thinking about the, the issues in a, in a also very creative way, because it's very important to be creative, then you'll have some very interesting solutions. I actually think we make a mistake in Africa of leaving a lot of this to government. You know, I always say that a lot of the institutions in Africa are very young, and so you can't compare them to you know, the institutions in the West that have been around for, for centuries. But you know, it's also said, well, look at Korea. You know, they've done it in 50 years. You know, the bottom line is, is look, we're, we're, we're still trying to work out how we're going to develop our political systems on the continent. And I think, I think what we need to do is really look at, I personally believe, I think, private enterprise and some really uh, social entrepreneurism, if you want to I would call it, I mean, there's lots of terms for it, is what's required. Africa is certainly one of the richest continents, but where do we place that value? True to his art as a designer, Boateng believes the answer lies in packaging. You know, one thing in Africa, we all own a piece of land. It's kind of in, in us, family. But this land is not valued right now. You can't borrow against that. I mean, that's madness. In Africa, we're terrible marketeers. In fact, we are the worst marketeers on the planet. Because how could you can have, uh, have under your feet 60% of all the undiscovered resources on the planet and still look at yourselves as being poor? Dubai can market itself to get people to the desert when it's unimaginable conditions of heat. Right? I think where we have fantastic beaches, great climate, it shouldn't be that much of a hard sell. And by the way, let's sell it first. And let's see if the cell works, because right now there's no cell. One of the great things is, is, is we, you know, it was mentioned about South Africa. Well, they didn't think they could hold the World Cup. Everyone thought, what are you talking about? It's never going to work. It worked, right? It did indeed. Now they're having issues in Brazil. But Brazil was a long, yeah, of course Brazil will work. But South Africa, no, that's going to work. But it worked, because it was well marketed. At the end of the day, when it came to delivering, they did a fantastic job. Perhaps the key to infrastructure is not only investment, but also imagination. It's been since Made in Africa been promoting the fact that infrastructure is important, that people are starting to ask a question, because you've got a designer now talking about infrastructure as being the way forward. So it quite, quite like, well, why do you think so interested in infrastructure? I'm interested in it for one simple reason, is I see it as an opportunity. You see, create, as a designer, we're trained to look forward. So, you know, I design collections a year, year and a half, two years in advance. So we have an ability to see something, the opportunity in things. We're trained that way. So when I go to a place and there's nothing there, I can imagine what it can be. Now, the moment I'm able to crystallize the vision, the picture in my mind, then that's what makes it real. That brings us to the end of uh, this week's show. Many thanks uh, to my colleague, uh, guest anchor Lindy Mdongana. So uh, tell us, what do you think about building Africa? Can a tailor tell you what your city should look like? Is a cyber city a viable option? Tell us via Facebook or tweet us at Africa360 underscore ENCA or send us an email at africa360 at enca.com. So until next time, when we bring you Africa like you have never seen it before, do take care.